Uh, I'm Monica Postiglione, I'm the Executive Coordinator of the Turin School of Regulation and Fondazione per l'Ambiente. Uh, this is one of the online activities that we have been organizing since uh, last spring. Uh, there is no need to say that uh, we would have liked to organize this seminar in person, uh, but given the condition linked to the pandemic, we are forced to carry, to carry on our work uh, uh, and our moments of confrontation on environmental issues online. Um, I would like to thank the Fondazione Compagnia di San Paolo that support the institutional activities of, of Fondazione per l'Ambiente and Tony School of Regulation and that made possible the organization of this webinar. Um, today uh, we will talk about uh, natural capital achievements, critical aspects uh, and implementation of policies for sustainability. The aim of the webinar is to analyze and, uh, and deepen the concept of natural capital uh, by retracing its history and its evolution to better understand the way in which, uh, until now, um, its, values, uh, its value has been understood, declined and defined in economic policies. We will try to frame the concept of natural capital and uh, the ecosystem services uh, uh, to better understand the, the way in which uh, it is possible to measure these services. And we will try to describe uh, the strength uh, and the weakness of uh, international, national and local uh, environmental policies. Um, to do so, we have uh, four very high level speakers uh, that uh, are here today with, to discuss with us. I'm going to introduce them uh, one by one. So the first one is uh, Fibe Kunduri from the Aten University of Economics and Businesses. Uh, she's professor of sustainable development uh, at the School of Economics at the Aten University of Economics and Businesses, as I mentioned. And she is the elected president of the European Association of Environmental and Natural Resource economies. Mm, Professor Kunduri is uh, also the founder of, uh, and the scientific director of the research laboratory on socio-economic socio and environmental sustainability at the Athens Universities and uh, she's also affiliated professor at the Athena Research and Innovation Center. She is co-chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Network in Greece and the chair of the scientific uh, advisory board uh, of the International Center for Research and Environment uh, and Environment uh, and Econo Econo Economies. I'm sorry, at the chair of the, uh, of the scientific advisory board of the European Forest Institute. In the past, uh, she had the uh, academic position at the University of Cambridge, University College of London, and uh, University of Reading, and at the London School of Economics. Uh, she is she's also acting as a, an advisor at the, to the European Commission, to the World Bank and diverse national and international foundation and organization uh, at the national uh, level in uh, all five continents. So welcome, uh, Professor Konduri. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm honored to share a contribution uh, in this very um, interesting and prestigious uh, uh, panel. I am sharing my presentation. Can you see? Wait one second. I want to introduce also the other uh, speaker. And then we will start with the question. <laughs> okay, I thought you are introducing each one that is speaking. No, 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 I'm going to introduce all the speaker and... Uh, uh, okay, so the second speaker uh, is uh, Fernando Rodriguez from the University of Salamanca. Um, he is Professor Rodriguez, a standard track uh, professor and researcher in economics, uh, environmental economics and public policy at the University of Salamanca, as I mentioned. And uh, since 2007, he's also director of the Master in Economic Analysis of Legal Issues and Public Policies. 
He has been guest lecturer of law and economics, uh, public policies and environmental economics at different uh, uh, university and research center in Europe and uh, South America. He has uh, been working as a consultant to diverse uh, private and public institutions at the regional, national and international level regarding uh, energy and environmental regulation and finance. He's the main researcher at the project ES Values, which attempt is to build uh, the largest uh, repository of economic values from studies of valuation of uh, ecosystem services uh, all around the world, with the aim uh, to, of facilitating the evaluation of natural capital by benefit transfer. So welcome, Fernando. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'm going to present also the third speaker, who is uh, Aldo Ravazzi Duvan. He's uh, the technical secretary at the Italian National Capital Committee. He's um, past uh, and president uh, at the OSD Committee on Biodiversity, Water and Ecosystem. And uh, uh, now he's uh, teaching at the University of Roma Vergata, uh, Environmental Global Governance. So thank you, uh, Aldo Ravazzi Dovan, for being with us. And uh, we hopefully will have soon the connection of uh, uh, Federico Reginato from uh, Ires Piemonte. He's an anthropologist. He works with the research group uh, on uh, uh, sustainability and governance uh, of uh, Ires Piemonte. Uh, his work is uh, mainly addressed at uh, analyzing the relationship between education and sustainable development uh, uh, and the methodology of research uh, and uh, institutional design. Uh, hopefully soon he will uh, be with us. Uh, I'm already here. Ah, okay, so <laughs> I couldn't see you. Hi, thank you for having me here. So before starting, I would like to remind you for the, the people who are the audience that at the end of the discussion, there will be uh, some time, hopefully, for some questions uh, to the speaker. So if you want, you can write uh, on the chat and uh, we will select uh, the most relevant uh, question. So um, I will, now we can start. So the first um, question is addressed to Professor Kunduri. Um, and uh, yes, we would like to ask you to frame uh, the concept of natural capital. It's a theoretical and political framework. Uh, and uh, um, as a sort uh, of uh, second sub question, the role of natural capital in the European approach to sustainability, and in particular its role in the new uh, uh, Green New Deal. So please, Professor. So, once again, thank you for having me. I will try to quickly sketch the sustainability agenda global and European level and showcase how natural capital uh, is integrated in that agenda. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, very good. So these days I start all my speeches by referring to the three big tsunamis that we are currently facing is the pandemic, of course, and we're trying to control it with uh, uh, measures like uh, social distancing and lockdowns and so on and of course trying to find a solution with biomedical research. The pandemic is creating a huge economic recession which is um, quite um, substantial and uh, we face the challenge to avoid the pandemic turn into a major economic and financial crisis that will long outlast the health crisis and we know that in order to do that we need to keep the workforce employed, channel a financial support to the vulnerable, safeguard SMEs against bankruptcy, and um, support the financial system as non-performing loans mount. And of course, we need to put together fiscal packages comparable to the crisis-related GDP loss that will be financed by national debt. And we know that uh, 
almost all countries and uh, international collaborations of countries have done those. The third have done that, and I'm going to refer extensively to this um, with regards to what Europe has done. And I'm referring, of course, to next generation EU and um, the Recovery and Resilience Fund. Of course, the umbrella crisis that we'll be facing for quite some time now is a climate change. And at the moment, there is no country in the world that is not facing economic losses, but also loss of human life due to the extreme events of climate change. And uh, we had um, on the 17th of the September, uh, an announcement for the European Commission president proposing an increase um, in the ambitions of emission reductions from 40% compared to 1990 levels to 55%. 55%, of course, is not uh, large enough because what we need is a uh, global reduction target of at least 68% by 2030, and this is needed in order to capture uh, the, uh, the target of uh, a maximum of a plus 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the increase in temperature beyond which the risk of extreme weather events and poverty for hundreds of millions of people will significantly increase. So these are our main uh, threats. And uh, of course, we want to find a way to mobilize the sustainability transition, which is uh, basically mobilizing the implementation of an organizing principle committing human development goals while sustaining the ability of natural systems to provide the natural resources and ecosystem services upon which the economy and society depends. And we need environmental, economic and social sustainability. And of course we have um, a sustainability policy framework. Is the 17 sustainable development and goals of Agenda 2030, which is basically an integrated approach to all that concerns people, prosperity, and the planet, nature. Uh, we have the Paris Climate um, Agreement, uh, limiting global temperature to well below, uh, uh, to an increase well below two degrees Celsius. We have the IPCC report of 2018, which identifies that two degrees is too much. We need to keep the increase below 1.5, which basically implies zero net emissions globally by 2050. We also have a way to operationalize the implementation of the 17 SDGs because 17 goals are very difficult for any government in the world. So um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network with which I work has proposed six transformation, education, health, energy decarbonization, sustainable food, land, water, and ocean, sustainable cities, and the digital revolution for sustainable development. And of course, in 2019, in, uh, just before the change of the year, we have the European Green Deal for access, climate neutrality by 2050, protect biodiversity and reduce pollution, clean tech leadership, and just transition, leave no one behind. The European Green Deal has nine different policies with regards to sustaining uh, biodiversity, farm to fork, sustainable agriculture, decarbonization of industry, e-mobility, climate action, um, and so on. And it is supported by a budget of one trillion, half of it coming from the EU budget and ETS income and the other half to be potentially mobilized by public and private partnerships. 
Unfortunately, this um, uh, pathway was interrupted by the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. We know that flattening the infection curve steepens the microeconomic recession curve, and we have uh, the EU next generation um, uh, vehicle, the Resilient Recovery Fund, which is 750 billion in addition to the EU multi-annual financial framework to be invested in the recovery from the pandemic and in building back into a resilient pathway. The good news is that this recovery uh, the funds of the recovery fund uh, are earmarked uh, with regards to a 37% climate uh, mainstreaming and 20% digital mainstreaming. So green and digital is what the recovery of Europe should be. And we try to do this, we try to transform uh, our system using systems innovation, that is integrated and coordinated interventions in the economic, financial, political, and social systems and along whole value change. In systems innovation, uh, we focus on relationships where elements are arranged in such a fashion that gives rise to a new structure, a new structure that can achieve not just incremental uh, change, but fundamental transformations. What is needed, as it is identified in the IPCC report, is a rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented change in all aspects of the society. Incremental changes are not enough. We need systemic transformation. That's why we talk about the six transformations of the SDGs that can mobilize the transition to sustainability in such a pace so that we meet the 2030 goals and the goal of uh, 2050 neutrality, not just for Europe, because that is obviously not enough, but the whole of the world. And this systemic innovation approach is also mirrored in the climate pack of the European Green Deal, a system innovation that engages all stakeholders in co-designing the future vision, but also co-designing pathways towards this future use, um, vision. And the good news is that it's not just Europe, it's South Korea, it's Canada, it's Israel, it's the US, and uh, let's see what happens on, on the forthcoming elections because uh, candidate Biden has committed to some infrastructure green um, uh, recovery plan. And of course, the most important of all, I would say, is China's carbon neutrality commitment before 2060. So we have top-down mobilization. With regards to the European Green Deal, we have the climate law. It has uh, a number of weak points. I can get back to this afterwards, uh, but the good news is that it's there and it can get better towards truly incentivizing the implementation of camp on neutrality by 2030. What do we do in an integrated, interdisciplinary and systemic approach to change? First, we characterize the framework and we co-design future vision with stakeholders. We identify our natural capital, our socioeconomic and institutional framework and the stakeholders that are relevant. In any case study of any scale and any focus and stakeholders, of course, uh, refer to research and innovation uh, developers, uh, the business the financial system, the NGOs, the civil society as a whole. 
Once we have the first characterization, we model uh, our nature, society, and economy. In economy, of course, we have the institutional capacity of the framework, and uh, we, um, this interaction is modeled in a dynamic and spatial um, a dimension, and of course, taking into account uncertainty, which as we move further into the future becomes deep uncertainty. That is not only we uh, uh, have risk, but we have um, no knowledge on the probabilities of the underlying um, events. Then we apply our model, we estimate the total economic value and based on this total economic value of the uh, natural human and accounting capital, we allocate our resources uh, towards a, a welfare improvement for the whole of the society. And we try to implement our technological innovations, uh, social and uh, legally, uh, socioeconomic and legal instruments um, uh, and infrastructural solutions in a way that it transforms the system together with the people who are using the system and uh, we construct strategic management plans on which um, the stakeholders are committed. Of course, in order to estimate the value of our resources, we use systems innovation, uh, uh, we use um, ecosystem services approach. Uh, this ecosystem services approach, of course, you all know that it refers to provisioning services, regulating culture and habitat services of each and every resource. And this um, services and this translated into benefits which are then uh, monetized. And uh, it is quite important to monetize, to be able to characterize and translate into something that uh, can be incorporated in a cost benefit analysis and an investment decision allocation and can be communicated uh, to politicians and policy makers. Uh, it is important to um, capture the total economic value for each ecosystem service. And there we have use values, actual and option values, and uh, direct and indirect values. And we also have passive values uh, referring to existence value, willingness to pay for the continuation of the existence of uh, natural capital and the co uh, continuation of provision of the ecosystem services of a stock or flow of the natural capital. Uh, we have the uh, value for others, which is either inheritance values or altruistic value, and we also have warm glow values, values that are re there because we feel good by conserving the environment or um, or making uh, the environment available for future generations in a condition that it can satisfy their, our own needs, at least as well as, as ours. And of course, we know the big literature on, um, on the uh, measurement of this total economic value. There are revealed preference approach, stated preferences approach, just what is crucial is that the total economic value is a systematic tool for considering full range of impacts on human welfare. It reflects the preferences of individuals. It is um, uh, statistically, uh, is, you can uh, statistically estimate it and it's essential for making allocation decisions. With regards to the European Green Deal, I am uh, chairing together with Professor Sachs from Columbia University, a big uh, senior working group that tries to uh, identify the pathways for joint implementation of uh, the uh, SDGs, Agenda 2030, and the European Green Deal using, that is, the nine policies of the European Green Deal that I referred to before, biodiversity, farm to fork, sustainable agriculture, green energy, sustainable industry, building and renovating 
sustainable mobility, eliminating pollution, climate action. What we are trying to do uh, here by acknowledging natural capital, human capital and accounting capital, trying to build pathways that, I, that allow the joint implementation of sustainable development goals, the nine European Green Deal policies that I just showed, and the European semester process recommendations. We do a three mapping, 3D mapping between these three for each and every country of the 27 countries of, the, of Europe. And we join the results of this three mapping in terms of weaknesses of each country and use technological pathways and the national energy and climate paths in order to construct recommendations for investment pathways. And these investment pathways are gonna be supported by portfolios that derive from the recovery fund, the European Green Deal, and the enhanced MFF of the European Com Commission. And of course, we also calculate implications for job creation and just transition, an inclusive transition. Our recommendations, will, which will be out before the end of the year, will be for politicians and decision makers to identify investment and um, uh, enable them to absorb the funds from the recovery fund and the European Green Deal, but also to build public-private partnerships um, uh, towards uh, the transition to sustainability. And at the end of the day, we want to create a climate pact manifesto to engage together with politicians and policymakers, business, the financial sector, and the uh, whole society. For three major mobilizers, there's three major uh, pathways. One of them is decarbonization, of course. If you look now at the national energy and climate paths of uh, the uh, European uh, member states, you will see that in order to increase uh, the ambition for uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions to 55%, we need an increase in investment of 350 billion per year compared to what we need to invest given uh, the current commitments in the country-specific national energy and climate parks. And it is quite interesting to know that uh, uh, we have um, member states that are already goal free. We have uh, member states that are committed to phasing out goal. And we have member states that are just considering and we have some that are not even considering phasing out goal. So um, this phasing out of a goal is an important uh, um, mobilizer towards the sustainability transition. And of course it has to be incentivized and it has to be financed uh, in efficient ways uh, in, in order uh, not to become uh, devastating for the gold uh, producing uh, regions and countries. And there are ways to do that. There are instruments to do that. There are transition bonds to do that. The Just Transition Fund of the European uh, deal is there. The Recovery Fund, it's also providing resources for that. And it is quite important to have this facing out of uh, fossil um, combined with the, the uh, technological pathways of the new technologies. And these are becoming quite obvious in, it's not just the fact that uh, renewables are becoming cheaper, storage of renewable energy is becoming more efficient and we have um, much more storage installations. It's not just the fact that we have huge potential for um, energy efficiency, mainly in buildings, renovating buildings, but also in uh, new buildings. Um, it is not just the transition to circular economy uh, creates a huge potential for 
uh, mitigating uh, CO2 emissions. We also have the uh, newly announced EC annual sustainable growth strategy, which um, identifies the European flagships for reform and investments. It's talking about hydrogen, it's talking about the renovation, recharge and refuel, connect, modernize the UID and key digital public services, scale up, and of course, reskill and upskill. We need to make our uh, labor force able to join in this fourth industrial revolution to keep up with the pace of the technological advancement. The other big uh, mobilizer can be circular economy because it creates savings for businesses, it creates jobs, it reduces the carbon footprint and the environmental footprint. And it's relevant not just for big companies, but also SMEs and it creates a, a, a nice opportunities for public-private partnerships. And here, again, it's important to use uh, after the, in order to understand the impact of circular economy, you use a life, you need a life cycle analysis, but then you also need to identify, to monetize the change in the, in the um, environmental footprint so that in an investment decision, you can incorporate that as well. The other big mobilizer is climate change adaptation infrastructure, early warning systems, uh, resilient infrastructure, uh, managing water resources, which generate a triple dividend, avoiding losses from climate change, creating economic benefits for investment program, and creating social and environmental benefits. As I said before, we need to follow EU taxonomy for identifying sustainable investments. And then based on this taxonomy, we can accelerate them and incentivize them using um, um, uh, efficient and uh, equitable, uh, sustainable finance to make things easier for people who are investing in the new technologies. These are the arguments we also put forward as Lancet Commission, which is the uh, new Lancet Commission on the recovery from COVID-19 is a well commission. And in the first statement that we issued on the 75th session of UN General Assembly, I am chairing the uh, task force on job-based green recovery, we emphasize exactly all that I said up to now. An economic recovery towards sustainable and inclusive societies based on SDG and the Paris Agreement with uh, public investment taking the lead, but also uh, creating um, the incentive to spare complementary private investments. And in order to uh, make the uh, transition to a green and digital economy, we also need at the same time to make an unprecedented commitment to reskilling and upskilling people. And I gave EU Green Deal as a good example of a policy see that can mobilize all that. I am closing this uh, speech by just referring to the cluster of sustainability transition that I lead. Uh, we have projects in all five continents and we focus on a research and global initiative mainly funded by Horizon 2020 but also uh, you, United Nations uh, funding. We also focus on deep demonstration and innovation acceleration and we do that mainly under our capacity as the uh, climate kick knowledge and information community of Greece. Uh, this is a, 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 um, under the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Here we mobilize many 
uh, climate mitigation and adaptation startups, but we also uh, implement deep demonstration pilot projects that can showcase how our systems innovation approach can mobilize the sustainability transition. And of course, we do many education and training um, uh, courses and uh, both at the academic and professional level. Our projects are mostly focused on circular economy and climate change, circular economy uh, for the marine sector, for the whole of the economy, but also educating entrepreneurs and investors in circular economy. We also work on blue growth, on global initiatives like the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Shipping and Ports, but also an initiative that tries to identify blue growth pathways for the Mediterranean, Black, Caspian, and Aral Sea. And of course, many uh, marine related projects funded from Horizon and uh, Interreg projects. We also work on water, food, energy nexus, and smart agriculture, uh, which is a major um, uh, sector. Uh, in uh, especially Southern Europe, but in the whole of Europe. And I will close by just indicating which uh, startups we are accelerating this year, which is an important um, um, uh, initiative uh, for uh, countries uh, like Greece, because these are just the Greek startups. It, uh, they, they are not the European accelerated startups for the year. Uh, to create the possibility of uh, the new of the youth to use their expertise and stay inland while creating jobs, creating economic growth, but also creating solutions for climate mitigation and adaptation. And of course, we participate in a number of funds that. Um, uh, finance uh, um, startups and other mature companies when they are uh, investing in impact investment and sustainable investment. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, it's uh, very interesting to uh, to know all these aspects of, uh, I mean, the, all the, the links and the, the, the complexity of the system, because uh, all the countries are in, are, you know, working together. We should uh, work all together. So it's very interesting, especially for our, our audience, uh, which is not uh, only European. And so to know what is happening in Europe, it's uh, very important because uh, from a point of view of sustainability, our policies are. Uh, you know, we are doing a lot, but on the other side, it's also important to mention other contests where other policies and other uh, paths uh, are, um, are growing. And so it's an uh, exchange of good practice is always uh, important. So we will move forward now. We will um, uh, go on with the second question, which is addressed to Professor Rodriguez. And um, it's related to the, I would say, complex the possibility to measure the natural capital. And so we would like to ask you to explain us which are the methods uh, to estimate uh, uh, the economic value of the natural capital. As thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the uh, Fondazione per l'Ambiente for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be here sharing this time with you and with these um, uh, highly well-known uh, colleagues. It's, a, it's an honor to be here with, with you all and with all the uh, attendants to, the, uh, to this webinar. So um, yes, I, I, well, I have a presentation in order to uh, try to order the ideas after this uh, uh, impressive presentation. Uh, mine will be much focused on academic issues, so um, do not expect the same level of novelty, but uh, expect a presentation from a university professor, yes, uh, explaining value of natural capital, how can we measure and why do uh, we need to measure it, what for. 
So um, this is what we are talking about. We are talking about natural capital. We are talking about uh, nature. We are talking about uh, what surrounds uh, us as nature. And when we speak about natural capital, we are actually using an expression that comes from economics. It comes from uh, capital. So uh, it's a, a parallel expression to that of physical capital, human capital, social capital. So we want to uh, talk about nature, of course, as nature itself, but remembering that nature provides us services that uh, gives uh, us support and, and give us uh, value for our survival, for our enjoyment, for our welfare. So uh, it's important to say uh, what natural capital is. It's important to say, to speak about how to measure it. And I'm going to do it from the point of view of uh, economics. Let me first of all say that um, when, uh, when, when we, the economists, we um, think about whether we can estimate the real value of nature or not, uh, I would say that there are two groups in the um, economics pro uh, profession. One of them uh, would say that, yes, we can do it. We can estimate the real value of nature. And if we do that, then of course, we are aligned with the idea that benefits and costs can be balanced. So um, you can uh, actually take rational decisions just by balance and balancing the cost of an action and the benefits taking into account the uh, benefits, sorry, the environmental part of it all. And then there are some, uh, well, if, if, if they do that, by the way, uh, the idea is that whenever you see some environmental asset, well, you are uh, in some way capable of uh, putting some value in terms of uh, euros, in terms of, of monetary units to the environmental assets you are uh, either researching or taking into account for some decision. And if you do that, then uh, the next step might be to consider those values within a certain system in which the value of infrastructure or the value of some other physical assets is taken into account. And then, of course, you can do that uh, balance. Apart from that group that yes, believe that uh, it's possible to, do, to, to estimate the real value of nature. There are some uh, group of economists that think that we cannot estimate the real value of nature. And out of that group that think that we really can't estimate the real value of nature, there are two positions. In one of them, one of the solutions would be, okay, then we should stop thinking about value in nature because it's impossible. There's no way that we can estimate a real value. And then there's another group. Okay, it, it, it might be that we cannot estimate a, a real value of nature, but maybe we can estimate a responsible value of nature. So maybe not enough uh, to um, be certain that the value of a tree is uh, a certain amount of money or the value of a bear is a certain amount of money, but enough to take into account for decision taking. Uh, responsible value, in my opinion, is, is a comfortable uh, concept because uh, it does not take you to uh, thinking that we might be able to define or to identify something that we might call a real value, but it lets us take decisions. So uh, it leads us to uh, some kind of monetary value in which uh, we do our best, we do, we, we use the most updated techniques and the most updated data to ascertain uh, the value of some asset or, or of some land extension, some environmental uh, aspect, some impact as well, some restoration, for instance. So we use uh, the best method we can, but maybe uh, we are not defending that what we are finding is a value as real as any product, for instance, that we buy in the market. If we buy some, uh, some product in the market, we, we may be uh, as certain as possible that uh, seeing the price, it could be like an average estimation of uh, value for uh, demand and supply. But from uh, if we are talking about environmental assets, probably that's not uh, very sound. 
So in order to uh, value nature and in order not to find continuous um, objections from people uh, that believe that nature cannot be value, I would suggest a second best approach. Okay, maybe we cannot find the real value of nature, but maybe that's not a problem. Maybe we can ascertain a responsible value and take decisions with it. So what we do at Salamanca and what I'm going to talk about, uh, about valuing uh, natural capital, please take, uh, take it as if what we are talking about is not about funding something called real value, but something that can be um, tra uh, translated into monetary values that can be expressed as euros, uh, but it's, it, it's only expressed as euros in order to uh, have a certain grade of comparison with some other assets and in order to compare it with some other natural assets. So it's a value that has validity uh, or has its plain validity whereas it lies within the same realm. And that realm is the realm of the environment, is the realm of the natural capital. So probably not to be compared to physical capital, but to uh, take responsible decisions about natural capital, impacts, offsets, restoration, whatever, within the realm of natural capital. This is the way we work, just uh, in order to probably lower uh, defenses from uh, maybe some of you who are probably thinking that nature cannot be measured. Okay, so once that has, uh, that, that has been said, I would say that there are two ways in which we can calculate the economic value of uh, nature. Uh, in one of the ways, we would start trying to calculate the value of a certain natural asset. For instance, this tree. This is, for instance, this is, by the way, a tree that you might find if you come to the province of Salamanca. This is an encina, so this is the kind of tree from which the small pieces of fruit called bellotas um, come. Uh, so uh, Iberic pigs usually eat those uh, bellotas and then produce Iberic ham. Um, so this is very typical from Salamanca. So we might try to calculate the value of this uh, natural asset or we might use a second, um, a second way, which is calculate the, the value of the, of the gained or lost ecosystem services. So uh, in any way, the problems we are going to find are mainly two. First of all, the sources of value. Environmental assets have different sources of value. One of them is use. We can use environmental assets, for instance, for food, for instance, for water, for instance, for enjoyment uh, within a certain environmental assets. But then we have an option value. Option value is the value that we uh, allocate to a certain asset just for having the option of using it at some moment. Just having the option. Having and the option to use has a value. But even if we don't uh, plan to ever have the option of using some environmental asset, there's also a value, a value that we allocate to uh, environmental assets, which is existence. We give value to, the, to some environmental assets just because they exist. We are happier because uh, panda bear exists. We are happier because the blue whale uh, is existing. We are happier or we are we are not so happy uh, when we know about uh, pollution in uh, Pacific Ocean, for instance. So existence is also a value. It's a source of value. And uh, in order to ascertain the value of, uh, of some environmental asset, of course, we should uh, have into account those three, three main categories. Of course, there are more smaller categories within them but those main three categories of value, those three main sources of value, which gives, up, uh, gives us um, some problems because most of those uh, sources are not allocated or valued by markets. So the value of environmental assets is not uh, formed within markets, for, except maybe uh, for a few, um, a, a small part of the environment of the environment such as uh, produce or or meat or cereals 
but most of the of the uh, of the services that nature uh, provides us actually do not come from uh, any market like uh, regulation of of air regulation of uh, climate regulation of gases regulation of uh, of water um, markets are not useful for that so what can we do to value all those sources of values um, there are three different three main categories of methods that can that can be used and by the way these three uh, large categories of methods can be used for uh, both ways i mentioned before either valuing a certain natural asset or valuing ecosystem services so first of all we could use market-based methods we could use prices but of course if we use prices then uh, we are limited to some uh, a small part of the ecosystem uh, of sorry of the of the of, of natural capital which is natural capital that um, comes from uh, well producing uh, food producing uh, water fibers uh, wood uh, so things that the market can exchange for a price and then we could use some market-based methods which are not based on prices but on cost so it, we could use some uh, whenever some environmental asset protects us from suffering some damage we could estimate that damage in order to estimate the avoided cost that we have enjoyed by having that environmental asset so that's a way of uh, evaluating the value of, of that environmental asset or we could also evaluate the induced cost that has been produced in a certain area because of the fact that some environmental asset has been lost so uh, in that case maybe we have some erosion or we have um, some other damage for instance caused by movement of uh, of the land and that induced cost it might also give us an estimation of the value that the former environmental asset was uh, providing us so that's the first part uh, of methods the second part of methods is uh, sorry that option quasi option should not be there just uh, don't read that but that revealed preference uh, methods are mainly two um, hedonic prices and travel cost. In the method of hedonic prices, uh, what we do is uh, try to analyze a certain market, which is uh, in which prices are formed from different parameters, uh, one of which might be the quality of the environment uh, that one of those uh, assets is enjoying. So for instance, we could analyze the price of uh, real estate, the price uh, of all the houses that have been sold in a certain year in a certain area. Take for instance that it's uh, 2,000 houses that have been sold in uh, the city of Madrid in one year. And then we would take the parameters, sorry, we would try to analyze the parameters that give value to all those houses that, has, that have been sold. So one of those parameters might be the quality of the environment. For instance, it could be being close to a park, or it could be have a view on uh, the mountains, or it could be being very close to the river. So if we take a sufficiently large sample of houses that have been sold with the different parameters that give value to the houses, we could try to estimate the parameter uh, that corresponds to the environmental quality and it, that's a way of course to evaluate the value of the environment or we could use travel cost in the method of travel cost what we uh, e evaluate is the money that uh, people families individuals groups whatever they spend to visit a certain environmental asset with, with a certain quality it could be a natural park it could be a national park it could be uh, just just a view so the, the 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 reasoning is that if you spend such amount in visiting a certain asset it must be because at least you value the uh, the views or the enjoyment of that uh, area in a certain uh, value 
Um, yeah, please forgive, uh, forgive me for that option, quasi option existence. Of course, cut and paste uh, mistakes, they're very typical. And then state preference. Um, why do we need a third method? Why is not enough with these two groups of methods? Well, because uh, I mentioned before that there are three sources of values and one of them was existence values. Existence value never goes through a market, never. You never pay for existence you pay for use, you pay for options, but uh, you never pay for existence as a group value. So whenever you want, you need to estimate the value of the existence of a certain environmental asset, uh, and you want to ascertain how much society would be willing to pay to make a certain asset to survive, then you uh, cannot use the market, you cannot use revealed, uh, revealed preference, you need to do surveys, you need a stated preference, you need to ask the people. Of course, what you are never going to do is ask the people, how much would you pay to guarantee the survival of a panda bear? This is not the kind of question you will ask. You will try to organize a certain um, a survey in which you uh, introduce someone in the contingent position such that with his or her decision it might be possible to guarantee the survival of a fan species for instance and then uh, you need a lot of information first first of all you need to provide the surveyed people with information you need to convince the person that uh, he or she is in a good position to uh, in some uh, uh, possible situation of society uh, it might be possible to to get uh, a certain aim and then uh, you need socioeconomic data about about them and you need to mix that information you need to create a profile of representative agent of a certain country or of a certain uh, region and then you get the value with a statistical methods and then of course you can uh, you can export that uh, data, that information to some other uh, people, to some other population. So those are the methods and with those methods, then of course we might face this problem, how to evaluate. Well, we might remember use two ways. We might try to evaluate a certain natural asset. So we might try to evaluate the value of the use of this uh, tree we might evaluate also the option of visiting this tree we might value the existence of this tree and actually until the end of the 20th century most of the studies of economic valuation of the environment uh, usually had this this uh, scheme they, they usually followed this structure so there's a natural asset it has certain values and we would like to know what the value of this natural asset is. But coming from the end of the 20th century, there were some uh, initiatives. First, there were some articles uh, and some books, um, a special article uh, published by Constanza in 1997 about the value of the Earth's uh, ecosystem services, and some initiatives from the United Nations, uh, from um, the European Commission, the TV initiative, Millennium Assessment. So there were some initiatives that started to suggest a different approach. And this approach would be, instead of valuing assets, why not try to identify the ecosystem services that nature provide us, and then try to complete a map of information about the values of different ecosystem services from different ecosystems or from different land uses because if we might do that not only would we uh, be able to uh, calculate the value of a certain environmental asset we might also be able to transfer values from some study to some other study so instead of valuing the asset we might focus on the ecosystem services of that asset so we might focus on the ecosystem services of of habitat, of regulation, of provision, cultural ecosystem services. There are different categories and uh, probably the widest one would have uh, more or less 60, uh, a list of 60 ecosystem services that have been identified. 
And if we do that, we could maybe not go to that specific natural asset, but we might take uh, different studies that have been performed in some other areas of the world, and then we might take the values from uh, those ecosystem services that have been evaluated directly in those areas, and uh, using databases, we might try to transfer those benefits, transfer those, tech, those uh, values to the uh, target uh, that we are estimating. So uh, if we need, for instance, to estimate the value of, of a certain piece of land in Texas, we might take, for instance, 30 studies all around the world that uh, are studying the same kind of ecosystems with the same kind of ecosystem services and would uh, probably try to transfer using benefit transfer functions, adjust it for each case, taking into account socioeconomic as well as ecological, uh, as ecological values. Uh, in order to, to, to take an estimation and uh, remember to take very better decisions, which is actually with what we want to do. This is what uh, Monica was uh, talking uh, about at first, uh, the, our, our initiative ES Values at the University of Salamanca. It's open to the public, it's open to you. You can browse it and you can see values from ecosystem, from economic analysis of ecosystem services from uh, different ecosystems. Thank you so much. This is all for my part. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Rodriguez, for this uh, clear explanation uh, on the way nature can be valued from uh, uh, an economic point of view and, uh, uh, and of what can uh, not be valued, actually, because it's also important to mention the fact that, that not everything should be valued economically. So let's move on. We are uh, cleared in late. <laughs> and um, so the next question uh, is uh, for uh, uh, Professor Ravatti Duvan. Uh, we have been uh, uh, talking uh, with this, uh, we have been analyzing with, with these two first speeches uh, uh, about uh, the concept and the way it is possible to measure the natural capital, but now we would like to bring the discussion to the national and local level. So our third question uh, is, um, it, uh, it concerns the way in which uh, natural capital entered in the political agenda here in Italy at the national level. And uh, so we also ask you if you can describe us uh, uh, the state of the art uh, of uh, this uh, uh, system, uh, natural capital system here in Italy. Please, Professor Duvan. Thank you, Monica. I'm pleased to share what we are trying to do in Italy to advance with the concept of natural capital strictly related to biodiversity and ecosystem services. And it's a nice, I think, and interesting attempt for, uh, to, to be shared with colleagues from all around the world, uh, I understand, uh, because there are not many countries who have tried to bring into the institutions the idea of natural capital. We did it through a law which is called uh, Environmental Measures for Promoting Green Economy and uh, Limiting the Excessive Use of Natural Resources. It's, it was the so-called Environmental Annex to the Annual Budget Law for Italians, you may remember it. And thanks to that, uh, we have now in Italy a special committee on natural capital. And this is made of a, a strange membership, quite interesting, I think. Uh, we have 10 ministers directly participating, or sometimes or even often their representatives, obviously, but trying to bring 10 ministers with relevant uh, uh, capacity of decision making with impact on natural capital means that not only you have a minister of environment, who is the president, by the way, of the committee, but you have the Minister of Economic and of Economy and Finance, you have the Minister of uh, Economic Development, how we call the Ministry for, in <coughs> sorry, for Energy, Industry and Trade, we have the Ministers for Agriculture, for uh, uh, Regional Development and so on. We also have two representatives from the subnational level, the networks of the 20 Italian regions and the 8,000 cities, and we have 10 experts from the technical scientific community. Uh, Italians, but not only Italians, may recognize some name. We have five professors from the university, Professor Blasi, who has been the president
president of the Italian Botanic Society, Santorini, who has been uh, the president of the Ecological Italian Society, uh, Professor Russo, who has been president of the Marine Biodiversity Society, Professor Scarascia, well known in the wood, uh, wood expert and uh, wood development, wood and forest development, and we have Professor Danovaro, who is the president of the station Anton Dorn on the Vulcan uh, Vesuvio in Naples, who is at the center of many uh, inter interesting researches. We have three representatives from environmental NGOs, WWF Italy, Fra Gianfranco Bologna, some may know him because he has been the young assistant of the founder of the Club of Rome, of Aurelio Pecce. Uh, we have Zampetti, who is the director of Lega Ambiente. We have Selvaggi from the League of the Protection of Birds. And we also have two former ministers. Enrico Giovannini is quite well known because he has been for 10 years uh, chief statistician at OECD, promoting all environmental accounting uh, and uh, all the work beyond GDP. He is uh, now back at the University of Rome, but he is leading the Italian Alliance on Sustainable Development. And some may remember him for a couple of years as Minister of Labor and Welfare. And we have Edo Ronchi, the president of the uh, Foundation for Sustainable Development, who has been a Minister of Environment for four years uh, in uh, a few years ago. Now, from the law, there is an obligation for this committee to prepare a report every year by the end of February, and it is sent uh, to the President of the Council of Ministers, to the Prime Minister, and to the Minister uh, of Economy and Finance, so to try to start an integration of the concept of cap natural capital into the decision-making process. Because this is the uh, what we are trying to have, uh, following the law, the mandate from the Parliament, we have three main uh, duties. The first is to try to provide environmental information and data on the Italian natural capital, and both in physical and monetary units, based upon United Nations methodologies, SEA, SEAEA, as experts know, OECD methodologies, European Union methodologies. We should try to include ex ante and ex post evaluation of public policies, its effects, its impacts on natural capital and ecosystem services. If the first mandate is difficult, as you may imagine, you can imagine how much more difficult it is to try evaluation of public policies. And the third mandate is to promote the adoption at central and local level of environmental accounting system, environmental budgeting aimed at monitoring and reporting on implementation and effectiveness of policies and measures undertaken for natural capital protection. Now, uh, the report, as we said, is sent by the Minister of Environment, President of the Committee, to the Prime Minister, to the Minister of Economy and Finance. Uh, we have tried to uh, structure our reports with the measurement and conservation state of national ecosystem on the physical assessment of ecosystem assets and services by some pilot studies, trying to launch economic evaluation of at least some natural capital and ecosystem services, uh, giving some guidelines for the evaluation of effects of policies on natural capital and recommendation on how to go ahead. What I am very pleased is to say that this uh, effort, this attempt of bringing natural capital inside the decision making uh, at the highest possible level uh, is uh, strongly linked to the main international references and initiatives to which Professor Kunduri and Professor Rodriguez have uh, made reference several times in their presentations earlier. So very briefly, just to remember that we are trying to bring inside the Italian culture of public administration, of enterprise, of research, the work of the MEA, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, launched by the United Nations, the TEAB report on the economics of ecosystem services and the biodiversity, the OECD work on scaling up finance for biodiversity and economic instruments for biodiversity, but also the WAVE's work on uh, wealth accounting and the valuation of ecosystem services, the work at uh, UNDP, which is working very well in a number of countries. Uh, we are also trying to use the so-called MAES uh, at the European Union level with the European Environment Agency and its topic center pushing strongly for that, the mapping and assessment of ecosystem and their services, 
the Biofin I can buy you NDP with its catalog of financial instruments for biodiversity, natural capital and ecosystem services. We are aware and we took inspiration, I must say, from the UK Natural Capital Cap Committee, which was established in 2012 and uh, has been prolonged several times. I must say I would like to share a moment of, uh, uh, of reflection to pay tribute uh, to the memory of Georgina Mace, who has been one of the active experts of this UK Natural Capital Committee, a uh, very high level expert on uh, biology. She passed away the last month and she has been a colon in all the uh, fora on uh, biodiversity, natural capital around the world and climate change most recently. Uh, the difference of Italian Natural Capital Committee with the U UK Natural Capital Committee is that we are trying to bring that into the institutions. Maybe we have been m too much ambitious, uh, but we tried at least. Uh, the UK Committee is based on seven scientific experts of very high level and quality. And they report uh, to the government of UK, and the government has to respond to the consideration recommendations by the scientific committee in their independence and autonomy. We tried, the parliament gave us the mandate to put together the political community, 10 ministers, the multi-level uh, governance, regions and cities, the main research centers which are uh, around in the country, sorry I didn't mention them but they are key in our work, Bank of Italy, uh, the central bank, ISTAT, the statistical office, ENEA, the Special Agency for uh, um, Energy Renewables Efficiency, ISPRA, the Environmental Agency, and uh, uh, the contribution by ISPRA colleagues, I think Alessio Capriolo is around uh, today listening to us, and the National Center of Research. So these five public research centers are helping together with the ministers and their representatives, with the ten re technical scientific experts, to bring something which is a, a, a coalition, in a way, of experts working in different uh, uh, areas, in different institutions, trying to push things. Uh, we know that we have some activities also in some countries, in Teralia, Netherlands, Germany, Mexico, and uh, also we like to mention Costa Rica, who has made a fantastic effort on ecosystem payments analysis and trying to set up ecosystem payments. So then, when you go into the detail of the reports, you will see that we are using the definition which has been adopted by the uh, UK committee, the elements of nature that produce value or benefit to people, etc., etc., soil, subsoil, water, atmosphere. We can go into the details in the reports. We have brought into our Italian reports the results of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. You can here recognize the structure, the scheme of the relationship between the ecosystem services and their functions and the constituents of well-being which are impacted by the different ecosystems. We have developed a special reclassification of the national territory, which is normally made of 20 administrative ecoregions, going through and redefining five terrestrial ecoregions, how can we say, uh, five macroecosystems, Alpine, Po Valley in the north of the country, Apennine, uh, the mountains in the, in the center of the country, the Mediterranean on the Tyrrhenian seaside and the Mediterranean on the Adriatic seaside. And we have tried to recalculate a number of indicator and data available based on these five more uh, consistent, more coherent uh, ecoregions. Uh, we've gone through the analysis and we've tried to uh, put together all the data we found around on uh, uh, the flora inventory, the fauna inventory, uh, those who are experts in uh, nature and biology can recognize uh, this number quite easy. We've tried to start some cartography ecosystems uh, uh, representation which have been uh, developed in uh, research centers and uh, in university, putting them together and giving to all the experts in the national community this knowledge uh, community. So we have, for example, this nice Italian ecosystem chart uh, based on the work of Blasi and his people at University of Rome and the large network around the country with the support of the Ministry of Environment and of the Environment Agency. And we've tried to go through the pressure factors on natural capital and related threats. I will leave this to the uh, reading of those who are more interested to go through, but you can recognize the most important thing. 
we've put together the statistics and the data that we found on forest, on woodland density, on the global carbon content stocked in Italian forest biomass, the amount of wood from Italian forests, which are a good signal from Italy because we have an increase in uh, forest uh, in spite of the trend of the last decades. We've been working with m on marine and coastal area, but when I say we've been working, we've been putting together research on the are these areas we've tried to advance, but we've tried to make this uh, uh, a sort of a national patrimony of knowledge. Uh, the same on agriculture, the inventory of land and use made by the environmental agency ISPRA is key from this point of view. We have the reports for the climate change convention which have helped us also uh, we have some studies on metropolitan areas uh, with some specific studies on trying to understand where we are to quantify things. Some of them are experiments, but we are trying to advance and to put this in, uh, in common knowledge. We are trying to use as much as possible the United Nations SEA, which has been absorbed in a European Union regulation, as many know, and we try to advance on environmental accounting and the experimental ecosystem accounting, and many of you will be aware of the <coughs> ongoing process of updating of the United Nations manuals and guidelines on how to prepare these data, statistics, and indicators. Uh, Professor Rodriguez has already introduced a number of uh, uh, economic system that we have for valuation of natural capital, and Professor Kunduri also user, uh, usually uses them from use to non use values to non-use values. I will not go into the details, but we are trying to promote this also. We have a number of uh, approaches, uh, uh, experiments of economic accounting and valuation of natural capital, some case studies. And this comes mainly from ISPRA, the environmental agency which is in Rome, and from JRC in ISPRA, which is by chance and the name of a little city in the north of Italy, where the European Union Joint Research Center is based. We have some confusion between ISPRA and ISPRA sometimes. And so some work has been done on land consumption, on marine and coastal areas, on wetlands, on countrywide ecosystem services in general. And all these uh, data and what we have been able to report are in the, uh, on the website of the Italian Ministry of Environment. We have closed uh, every report with a number of recommendations. Here I have extracted some of them. We have the uh, recommendation to develop an accounting system explicitly considering natural capital and ecosystem inside uh, uh, the, the different governance level to bring it into the, the accounting national system. We are asking to create a coordinated system of data collection and statistical analysis for the pressures on natural capital. We are proposing to enhance the technical skills in the public sector because we need people we need capacity and uh, to, to measure, to map, to quantify, to try economic assessment of very difficult issues, to assess, as we know. Uh, we are proposing institutional responsibility to build a normative procedure for ex-ante sustainability assessment of public policies. Before approving a law, a strategy, a plan, or a program, we already have strategic environmental assessments, but it would be helpful to institutionalize a specific assessment uh, with the impact on natural capital. So the idea is to integrate natural capital with the within the current procedures. Uh, we are recommending to support environmental fiscal reform and endeavor economic instruments, for example, the removal of environmentally harmful subsidies which are impacting natural capital protection. Uh, we know the debate about environmentally harmful subsidies and environmentally friendly subsidies, what in Italian we now call SAD and SAF, with Italian acronyms. You remember, and uh, they were mentioned earlier, uh, the commitments at G20 and G7 to remove a fossil fuel subsidies, FFS, and we know how they are, most of them, impacting also on biodiversity and natural capital. We are even uh, developing an idea of biodiversity harmful subsidies to be kept under control. And many of among us know the French report in uh, 2012, the so-called Centenary report on biodiversity harmful subsidies, and the report last year by Germany, by the German Environmental Agency on biodiversity harmful subsidies. This is key and important because it's related to the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Aichi targets. One of the Aichi targets 
as to remove subsidies and incentives which are harming biodiversity. It is related to sustainable development goals in several areas, and it's also mentioned in the recent leaders' coalition declaration on these issues. Uh, on the recommendation and next steps, uh, we could speak for hours, but I would like just to close with this last slide where I have summed up some some what I would call takeaways. The Italian Natural Capital Committee has produced three reports in the last three years. This year, only a declaration on natural capital, uh, hopefully policy relevant. Uh, the main objective is to push for bringing natural capital into public decision making. But we need to work also to bring it into private decision making. Uh, company reporting from this point of view is key. In the European Union, we have approved a non financial reporting directive, and probably we should advance them to have more explicit and more transparent reporting on natural capital, biodiversity, ecosystem services used, exploited, or served by companies. The disclosure in the European Union sustainable finance strategy may help also a lot from this point of view. 2020 was to be the super year. It's now shifted to 2021, but we have a convention on CBD with the new COP in China. We have a natural capital declaration and its advancement. We have the work at the climate change uh, in the UN convention, which is helping also on the biodiversity and natural capital way. Uh, but may I encourage all of us to make a strong link between ca natural capital statistics, environmental accounting, all the discussion about beyond GDP, how GDP is important but not sufficient as we have the SDGs, we have to measure, we have to uh, report more and more, we have to use indicators for these, uh, <coughs> for these variables which are key in the state of our planet. We have to keep an eye to the link to economics and public finance, we mentioned the question of subsidies, Fuve uh, Konduri mentioned biodiversity finance issue, which is increasing finally in importance. Uh, can we remember that we don't have only to protect, preserve, and safeguard our natural capital and biodiversity? We must also try to increase it and enrich it. It's not only a matter of uh, mm, defensive approach. We must be in some kinds uh, uh, proactive. Uh, when we made uh, uh, this uh, um, the fusion version of the natural capital reports in Italy. Uh, this is something we prepared both in Italian and in English with the World Bank. Uh, we try to uh, underline this concept. We have to increase and enrich our natural capital. By the way, there is a very nice introduction by Pavan Sukdev, which is extremely useful. And the final word is to uh, recognize the fourth capital. So I know that some experts don't like the idea of natural capital, obviously. We cannot give a price to anything, we cannot give a market to anything, but in many cases we can use the concepts of economic analysis and the markets to advance the defense of natural capital. Uh, the fourth capital, disregarded capital, as Herman Daly used to put it, we have invested traditional capital, which is at the center of public and private decision making. Uh, sometimes we have uh, human capital uh, and social capital but the natural capital has been systematically disregarded and forgotten, and we needed it. And this is a way to convince the traditional communities of economists and financial analysts uh, to bring it on board in public and private decision making. Thank you for your patience. I will finish here. Thank you very much for explaining us uh, the way the National Capital Committee and the reports uh, that has been made uh, uh, in the last three years, and also for giving us this uh, in the next uh, period. So uh, I'm sorry we are running out of time and leaving the floor to um, to uh, uh, the last question, which is uh, uh, addressed to Federico Reginato. Um, we know that uh, this. Uh, policies uh, that are often very well designed and uh, which objectives are 
you know, like uh, noble and just, but uh, when uh, it comes to the local level, sometimes it is difficult to enforce them. So the question is, um, we would like to ask you if you can please describe us uh, the way in which uh, at the regional level here in Piem in, uh, in Torino and in Piedmont, uh, sustainability policies are implemented and uh, which uh, are the emerging challenges uh, uh, when these policies are adopted. So please, uh, Federico. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for inviting me here. Okay, I will start by saying that I will present a, a slightly different, um, uh, a slightly different text instead of those that were present before. I choose to, to uh, as part of IRES Piemonte, I've choose to, to construct uh, a more pragmatic intervent and to focus on a social point of view to enlighten some, both uh, the ways and both the challenges that the sustainability policies found uh, at the regional level. So to start, if we think about um, regional uh, strategy for sustainable development, we can think about them as a ramification of the national strategy that lies on two complementary processes. So on one side, uh, the regional strategy is in charge to activate uh, what we can call a fertile production of new policies, programs, partnership, with the aim of guaranteeing the dissociation between the economic growth and its negative impact on the environment. On the other side, uh, the same strategy must define uh, necessary local and internal instrument priorities and actions, ensuring the contribution of local planning toward the realization of national objectives in terms of sustainable development. So if the first uh, step uh, regards the producing of new policies and programs, this second one is more concentrated, concentrated on the activation of internal process of reasoning, communication, organization, of new ways of conceiving, orienting, and also defining regional politics and actions. In this sense, uh, integrating policies and, and, uh, and priorities through knowledge of territorial policies and projects it retains the same importance as producing new frame of reference and um, for politics. So this binary, uh, this ramification is reflected also on the binary frame uh, within which the regional strategy is constructed. On one side, the regional strategy of Piemonte is part of an interregional hub decided by the Ministry of Environment, Land and Sea Protection dedicated to the theme of circular economy. Uh, together with Emilia Romagna and Lombardia. So in this sense, circular economy must be the main theme of the regional strategy. On the other side, the creation of a regional strategy is in this case, but in, in each case, supported by a, an, an administrative context already charged by a series of documents and activities linking to sustainable development. So in the case of Piemonte, we uh, have the regional strategy for climate change of 2017, for example, or the regional plan for mobility and transportation of January 2019, which is dedicated to the reduction of pollution emission and to enhancing the cyclability on the world region. Uh, is linked to the protocol for the green education of 2016, with which we try to create a link between the educational institution and the productive tissue of the region. And uh, so, to bring together these two aspects, to keep together these two instances, uh, we need to uh, reason on a way to integrate uh, different uh, politics and to identify new ways of work that allow us, in, in some sense, to bypass sectoral and restrictive logics that produce the fragmentation of jobs and of their regulation. Uh, parallelly, we need to uh, invest in uh, education and knowledges uh, aimed to construct and identify these new jobs and to promote educational and training paths, both for civic society, for private and for public enterprise and institution. Finally, we need to construct valutative process and indicators able to level and innovate the qualitative process of in, in I mean, uh, from a side, uh, from a point of view, both economical, social, and environmental. 
So starting with these guidelines that are all centered into the interdisciplinary and in the coherence between different programs, we focused as a research group on three pillars to uh, enhance the regional strategy. The first pillar is uh, governance, is the one of the governance, of course. So we need to construct both an institutional and a non-institutional cadre system to manage sustainability and to institutionalize the different working tables and projects already there, already present in the region. So uh, while the institutional uh, governance requires model of collaborative governance able to involve all the interested part also on a normative way, uh, the, the non-institutional system is more concentrated on, on the need to, uh, to, to, to build, I mean, on, on uh, requiring instead to build a proposal that is, must be comprehensive of common direction and intent. So we can say that uh, on, on this point, even if Piemonte, we already have an interdirectional table on climatic change, uh, we still probably don't have instruments and methods to activate the decisional process, neither to improve integrated actions. Moreover, this uh, is, is uh, stipulated also by a just acquisition of organizative levels and by a fragmentation between the different regional directions. So in this case, it's mandatory to rethink the activities of organizing structures already present in the territory, redefining competencies of regional structures accordingly to the objectives of the strategy. We are trying to do this um, by spreading this sort of governance building into different projects um, with which we try to construct working tables that slowly are aimed to develop in local governance and to build the transversality and uh, I mean and uh, transversal communication between actors and this is a way also to address uh, the second point, the non-institutional governance that must be built, that found its main criticity in the fact that uh, often there is a, a spread of diffidence toward the institutional action. And we, in this sense, uh, promoting partnership and collaborative process among the local realities, and together with creating modalities that can allow us to transfer the content of the strategy on local levels, uh, maybe a, a reasonable uh, action to overcome these, these difficulties. So the second pillars we identified and that we repute strategical is the knowledge, both intended in the sense of communication and in the sense of education and training action. So enhance cultural and technical competencies um, as to be bring on together with an interconnection of the education, educative institution, schools and university and the productive sectors. So the reality is that today you're experimenting transformation in their way of leading and, and conceiving the world in the light, of course, of uh, sustainable development. So in this sense, uh, the main criticity that we, we have noticed lies in the communication. Uh, there is still a big communicative action that needs to be activated. We already addressed it by digitalizing the State of Environment Report and the IRIS Annual App Report that are actually uh, the, the main data collectors able to intersect environmental questions with economical and social criticism in the region. Still, uh, this digitalization seems to, to not be sufficient and we need to invest more in constructing uh, experimental and laboratorial practice and events to involve the citizenship at a different level. Uh, for what concern the education and the training process, we have, um, we are since 2016 constructing uh, through different projects uh, um, a frame within which uh, relating uh, the, the didactic that is produced inside the educa educative institution with the transformation that are lived by the by the working. For, so the first uh, was represented by the protocol for the green education, a protocol able to create a working table with more than 50 stakeholders uh, that have for common objectives both um, um, to grow the, uh, the, uh, the sensibility and education for the citizenship, 
so to, to build a common cultural ground and to enhance the formation training of professional but also of students in the schools. And after this, this project has run parallelly to a transfrontal reaction, the Alcotra, that uh, resulted in the, in the, um, in the project HAPFER, so to apprehend to produce green, which has been a project that involved uh, more than 50 schools, more than 70 schools, sorry, on the metropolitan area of Turin, and that uh, constructed the laboratorial and experimental experience with a, uh, with a whole bunch of stakeholders of the protocol. So in this sense, we are seeing that on the educational camp, there is a reality, there is an interest that is growing between the private world and the educational system in communicating each other. The last point that we have identified is the methodology or, or the method. So um, this is, the, uh, is a question that we identify because there is the need to realize an integrated system able to read complexity and specificity on a regional level that at the same time must be positioned toward the NSDS objectives must be standardized and must realize integration among strategy, action, plans, and roles of the actors involved. In this sense, we have activated two evaluation line, two evaluative line. The first one is uh, environmental, where we are implementing analysis that pose attention toward the ecosystemic services based on technical reports on historical series. And contemporaneously, we are working on the creation of common languages of sharing pack of data while improving aspects related to both the consultation of institutional stakeholders involved in procedures and the public participation to test new remote methods. Um, on, the, on the second line, on the sociological line, we are developing, we are trying to develop a multidisciplinary methodology to interconnect quantitative data to monitor the progress over time of a set of common national sustainable development indicators and qualitative data that are collected with techniques such as open interview, shadowing, case history, and forums to analyze the implementation of the programs and action promoter under the strategy. This, we think, will help us uh, to know what has really happened during the implementation of specific program and action, to judge whether and in what terms what has been implemented corresponds to the design of the policy, and to explain finally why the desired results have been or not have been achieved. So the main criticity and the main action that we are taking in this sense is the absence of uh, an integration between quantitative data able to construct common indicators and qualitative data. Because only in, this, in the latter case, we, were we are able to account realistically for uh, the territory, both in a, in a qualitative perspective, both in an historical perspective. What we are interested in is not only the achievement of some action, but the progress, the linear progress towards certain action. Um, so to close up, I will just uh, br uh, brief some, some uh, outputs that this, uh, this intervention are producing, connected uh, within the, the, the reference development model of the circular economy. So the first one uh, is in, in the theme of the research and development, the R&D, uh, where we were able to work uh, toward the realization of the innovation poles. So uh, aggregated as mass large companies and research organizations that are active in specific technological and sectoral fields. Uh, to get, today we have in Piemonte seven innovation cluster currently operating and belonging to the smart manufacturing products, uh, energy and clean tech, green chemistry and advanced materials, life science and so on, and are promoting technology transfer, structure sharing and the exchange of knowledge and skills and also assisting associated enterprise. Uh, we are activated at technology platforms of particular importance in, the, in this case is the initiative of the bioeconomy platform aimed at the sectors of green chemistry and agri-food. And finally, uh, thanks to the innovation funds, we have activated the action for support organic investment programs at all level enterprise aimed at introducing innovation in the, products, uh, in the production process to transform and to innovate them. Uh, on the side, we are working uh, on the side of multi-utilities, 
trying to keep together both this uh, transfer of knowledges and competencies from private reality to citizenship and to work to a more uh, horizontal, horizontal, non-institutional non, non governance. In this sense, we're working with different mutualities on the side of the corporate social responsibilities, in particular on programs that are uh, addressed to citizenship and aimed at involve, involving them uh, in decisional organization. Finally, for the team of food system, we're working with the University of Gastronomic Science of Polenzo to creating for to implement the project for the circular economy for Food Hub, for the implementation of a platform for in-depth analysis, cultural exchange and good practices uh, in respect to the food system developed in the region. I think this, uh, this is all. So um, what we think is that uh, to answer both the, the, the question, which ways at the regional level sustainability policies are implemented and which are the emerging challenges when these policies are adopted, the answers lie in the, in the interdisciplinary methodologies, uh, in the, I mean, uh, interdisciplinarity and network relationship are a way to address and to implement these policies because the emerging challenges are often related not only to technical issue, but to a fragmentation of organ organizational, practical and technical order that sometimes are already present in the territory, but don't find, are not able to find the frame within which to recognize themselves, identify themselves, and communicate between them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Federico Reginato. Uh, so this was uh, the last um, question. Uh, was uh, really useful also to arrive to some co conclusion because uh, uh, I'm sorry we don't have time for the question that have been uh, already, some questions have already been answered on the platform. Um, we will share the, the webinar and uh, for those uh, who want uh, the presentation, probably there will be the chance to share some materials. But uh, we uh, wanted to thank uh, to thanks all of you for uh, being part of this uh, online event uh, and for you have been covering uh, quite a lot of the complex aspect, aspects of the natural capital issues and um, uh, thank you all also to the participants uh, 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 but uh, the, the idea and the, in this sense I want to link to this last presentation and uh, that we is that we strongly believe uh, in the importance uh, of maintaining uh, uh, an open discussion on uh, environmental sustainability and um, because uh, it is true that uh, we have uh, many uh, very structured policies uh, and very uh, structured tools so to evaluate uh, and to um, be active on these uh, issues on the natural capital but uh, uh, this topic should be constantly open to all sectors of the society and uh, because we all together should monitor uh, how these strategies uh, are uh, really acting and uh, uh, are protecting the environment uh, and so how these strategies are implemented and so the discussion uh, and the, um, this kind of the events uh, are uh, very important for us. Uh, and of course, we would like to organize other events. We would like to uh, talk again uh, on uh, these topics. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, we are 20 minutes in late, so I have to close. <laughs> but uh, I just want to mention the fact that uh, on our website, uh, you will find uh, some other materials on this topic, some other interviews interviews and that uh, we're organizing uh, other webinars uh, and the next one uh, will be at the end of November, November 24th uh, and it will be um, on the topic of food and environment which is still uh, quite well linked to the topic uh, discussed today. So uh, thank you very much for your attention and um, hopefully uh, we will have the chance to talk again soon. Thank you. Goodbye.